amidst the hustling, clamoring world, sometimes it's hard to hear the voice of God speaking to my soul. But in my quiet time alone, as I approach His holy throne, His tender words fall gently on my ears. He still speaks. I know. But the still small voice of God is heard above the doubts of this world. His timeless words ring out with hope today. He still speaks. I know. for that. Take your Bible and go back, if you will, to 1 Samuel chapter 17 and verse 10, where the Bible says, And the Philistines said, I defy the armies of Israel this day. Give me a man that we may fight together. And of course, there they are standing in the valley. And uh, there's a young man by the name of David. Uh, David picks up his sling. He'd already tried on the armor of Saul that was too heavy for him, very inadequate for him. But he's the only one that stepped up, if you would, uh, to the plate. He was the only one that stepped up and decided that he was not going to allow this Philistine to be able to intimidate or to be able to control the future of Israel. And so God used this young little man, if you will, in comparison to a big man, uh, one, if you would please, that was not well armed to one that was very well armed, one that was used to using just a sling to one that was used to, used to using full body army. And so one stood against the other that day. Now, can I tell you, it was not the power of the man and the God. It was the power of the God and the man that made the difference. And uh, the Bible teaches greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. And the Bible teaches that he'll never leave thee nor forsake thee. The Bible teaches I can do all things through Christ that strengtheneth me. But I want to talk to you this morning, if I may, on when retreating, when retreating is not an option. When retreating is not an option. I, I want to, if I may, name five times in your life where it's going to become very easy to retreat. Five times in your life where it would be very easy to lay down, if you will please, your sling or your sword or whatever it may be that you're using to be able to fight your battles and simply walk away. And then I want to give you some antidotes about these five times, I believe, that uh, come against every Christian, against every believer. 
And I want to give you some antidotes of how to be able to remedy that so that when times in your life, whether you're having a financial burden, whether you're having that which is a physical time of uh, distress, whether it is difficulties at the job, in the neighborhood, or in the home, when these things come upon you, what is it that you can do to be able to have some antidotes in your life to be able to come to a place of full deliverance. Let me give you just a couple of things to think about. Statement number one, uh, thinking about this now, uh, when retreating is not an option, okay? Uh, when your foe dares you, it is not time to retreat. When your foe dares you. Now here's the story. Here's the story found in 1 Samuel chapter 17 and verse 10. The Bible says, and the Philistines said, I defy the armies of Israel this day. Uh, give me a man. He says that we may fight together. Now there was a defying time. There was a daring time, if you would please, when that which looked like was impossible was going to come against that which looked like was very possible. When you had a huge, huge, if you would please, thing to overcome, and it looked like the person that was going to try to overcome this huge, dramatic one that was in front of him was just a little man in comparison to that giant. All right? So I'm saying this. I'm saying uh, when your foe dares you, it's not time to retreat. Now, what do you do all of a sudden when your foe dares you? Here's what you do. Statement number one, you reorganize your life. Reorganize your life. You know, sometimes you can reorganize something around you that makes the outcome very different. That's why the Bible says in Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 27, says, neither give place to the devil. So the devil is looking for a place in your, a foothold, if you will. I've always wanted, and, and we'll probably do it uh, before I get too old to do it, but I, I've always wanted to scale the side of a cliff just to see if I could do it. You know, just to see, and I, I promise you that I'll have ropes all over me. But uh, I, I, all right, because you're going to put your hand in a certain place. You're going to put your foot or your toes in a certain place to be able to do something like that. Now, can I tell you, uh, in order to be able to make it when your foes dare you and they try to tempt you to be able to quit, understand that we need not to give a place to the devil. Now, how do we do that? Uh, reorganize some things. All of a sudden, uh, you get some bad news. All of a sudden, uh, things come your way that is quite depressing or uh, things coming your way to overtake you and, and it kind of gets you off track a little bit and you begin to focus on that negativity. You begin to focus on those things that's pulling you down, not just uh, physically or not just mentally, but also spiritually. What do you do? Reorganize some things around you. You know, even if you work at a desk, you can reorganize your desk in such a way that when you look over this direction, there's something there that gives you a delight. There's something there that reminds you of something that is uh, helpful. Uh, even if you're out working maybe on the line somewhere and you're uh, out as an electrician, uh, you could look at something and focus on the clouds that day uh, uh, as you uh, work on those high lines or something to be able to re I'm talking about reorganize. Reorganize. Maybe you need to get up uh, from uh, a hard working day at the desk and get yourself a cup of coffee or a glass of tea or something. But reorganize. Maybe you need to start to sing uh, a, a song, a hymn, if you would, uh, that reminds you of God's goodness and God's deliverance and God's power. But reorganize. Maybe you need to get your Bible and go over and during your break time or during your uh, lunch time, open up your Bible and, and read verses that are encouraging and that's helpful to uh, be able able to get you through this time in your life. But I'm saying when all of a sudden the devil begins to dare you, reorganize some things. Statement number two, rest in the Lord. Rest in the Lord. The Bible says over in Psalm 37 and verse 7, the Bible says, rest in the Lord and wait patiently for him. Wait patiently for him. You know, not always does he move according to your timing. Well, God, I'm praying that you'll answer this prayer right now. Well, what if it's not God's will for God to answer that prayer right now? Does that mean that God is not powerful? Does that mean that God does not care? Does that mean that God does not love you? Does that mean that God has forsaken you? None of those things. It might not be God's timing to answer the prayer the way. By the way, God does know best. 
There are certain things that your child wants to do, but you say that might be good for later, but not right now. There are certain things that uh, your child wants to be able to accomplish, but you say, I don't think we ought to step out and accomplish that right now. You're just not ready for that, okay? And so what do you do? All of a sudden, when your foe dares you uh, to retreat, you decide that you're going to be somebody that will reorganize your life, rest in the Lord, resist, resist your foe's attacks. Resist them. Uh, James chapter 4 and verse 7 of the Bible says, submit itself yourself to God. It says, submit yourself to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Now, wait a minute. Before I can resist, I submit. You are more powerful on your knees with God than you are on your feet without God. God can help you. I think sometimes in our Christian life, we try and walk all the way by ourself, by ourself. God is your safety net. God is your line. God is the one that is there for you. You don't have to face your problems, your difficulties, and your complexities all by yourself when you've got God that will help you to be able to make it through. So uh, when your foes dare you, uh, uh, then just decide that you're not going to retreat. Statement number two, uh, when all of a sudden your fear drains you, sometimes there's fears that will drain you. Uh, Hello? Hello? You ever get on a ride, maybe at Six Flags, and all of a sudden, you know, uh, they buckle you in. I mean, the whole time you're in the line, everybody's excited. Your, your adrenaline is going. You're excited because everybody else is excited. And all of a sudden, it comes the time where you alone is buckled in. And they bring that harness down and snap. And then they push it in just a little bit extra hard to make sure you're not going to go anywhere. Now, by the way, when they do that, you know, most of the time, unless you just raise your hand and say, change my mind, change my mind, most of the time they're going to let you out you know, if you do that. But if not, it is too late. Right. I remember getting on that swing, and I don't know what they call it, but I got on it. And they, they came over, and they put that thing over me, and, and then they pushed it in. And then when they pushed in it again, I thought, oh, I can't breathe. And then all of a sudden, it started going like this. I thought, hey, this is neat. I get the swing. Lullaby, lullaby. Get the swing. This is great. And then it picked up more power. Then it went all the way around. My stomach that was so tightly nested to uh, my ribs was now down there somewhere, and I was still up here. Hey, can I tell you, listen, I'm saying this, uh, that all of a sudden when your fears drain, I, I don't know what it is now. I, I, I have a, I, I am kind of, uh, uh, in some areas, I am claustrophobic in some areas. Now, I can get on an elevator and I'm fine. I, I mean, I'm fine. You put me in the back of a taxi cab and I got five guys crammed in the back seat, I'm not fine. I am not fine. You know, I can climb up underneath a pew and I can work on a pew, but you took, put me in a place where, where all of a sudden I feel like I'm, I'm inside of something that's too tight, and all of a sudden I've got to start thinking differently because if not, I'm going to have a hard time. That's just happened over the past couple of years. Now, can I tell you, watch this. Do you understand this, that uh, when your fear drains you, don't retreat. Don't retreat. The Bible says in 2 Samuel chapter 22 and in verse 7, the Bible says, in my distress, it says, I called upon the Lord. It says, and cried, it says, to my God, and he did hear my voice out of his temple, and my cry did enter into his ears. So when you come to the Lord, can I tell you, he listens. He listens. I remember when the, the Barkers had the lightning that struck. It was on, was it Sunday night? It was a Sunday night. Lightning struck their home. Uh, out in the Forney area, struck the garage, and uh, by the time they got home, their garage was inflamed. 
And I remember hearing about that, and, and uh, I, I grabbed Brother Crutcher, and I said, come on, let's go. And so Brother Crutcher dove in the vehicle with me, and we drove uh, out there uh, over. We were eating at Brahms together that night and fellowshipping, and, and I said, come on, let's go. And so he dove into the vehicle with me, and we drove out to uh, the Barker's place, and uh, we prayed for them as we were driving. We were concerned about them uh, because we did not know the full depth of what had taken place that night. And can I tell you, uh, we, we were uh, uh, fearful, not that God couldn't take care of them, but because we loved them, we were fearful for them and for their lives. Well, what do you do when fear comes? Stand number one, you call on the Lord. The Bible says in Jeremiah chapter 33, this is an antidote. What do you do when fear comes and it begins to drain you? You call on the Lord. It says to call on to me and I will answer thee and show thee great and mighty things thou knowest not. Jeremiah 33 and verse 3. So all of a sudden, when fears begin to captivate your mind, then you call on the Lord. Amen. I never will forget sitting in that swing. By the way, I will probably never get in that swing again. But while I was in that swing, I remember this. I, I said, now, dear Lord, help me make it through this. And all these little kids, I mean, almost intimidating. All these little kids sitting around, yeah, yeah. And I'm like, dear Lord, please help me make it through this. You know, and uh, now, now, can I tell you, listen, did you know that some of the fears that you have is not like the fears that somebody else has? I had a dear friend of mine. Uh, he, is, he, is, he has a, 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 a great fear of spiders. Great fear. I've got another friend. He has a great fear of snakes. Great fear. They said that Napoleon had a fear of, of that which was uh, bridges. He was afraid to go across the bridge. So if there was an army over there that he could attack and be sure he was going to win, if there was a bridge between him and the army he was going to attack, he wouldn't cross the bridge. He'd just walk away. You know, every person that I have come across at one time or another, whether it's uh, an habitual thing, a habit, if you will, something that's a part of their DNA that they just have a fear about, or maybe an incident, will face fear sometime in their life. Right. Now, what do you do? You call upon the Lord. Number two, you concentrate on the Lord. Concentrate on Him. Think on Him. The Bible says over in Isaiah chapter 26 and in verse 3, the Bible says, uh, that will keep him in perfect peace, perfect peace, whose mind is stayed on thee because he trusteth in thee. So what do you do? You take your mind and you focus on him. You focus on him. Uh, I was uh, preaching over in uh, Nigeria. And when I was preaching a pastor's conference in Nigeria, uh, we uh, went to a village and uh, we had a lot of people that received Christ as Savior. And, of course, after you get saved, you're supposed to be baptized. And we looked like the disciples. We really did. Uh, so they gave, us, they gave us robes to put on, sandals to put on. And then we walked. I, 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 it seemed like 100 miles. It's probably only a quarter of a mile. But we walked out here to a pond, you know, and then the guys got their sticks and they went in before us and they hit all the water to make sure the snakes were gone. And they want to get all the snakes out. And so they went in right before us, you know, and one of my soul winning partners said, you think we're going to get bit? I said, I don't know. If I was a snake in there, I think I'd be gone. You know, but they took those, those sticks and they went in and we baptized a couple of people and then they come back in and uh, they get around us and go with those sticks again. And we baptize a couple more people and then they get around us. They walk in and they go, see, you ought to come on a mission trip with me is what you ought to. And, and, and they get those sticks and they go around. All right. Now, now, wait a minute. Watch this, if you will. Here's what we did. We concentrated on the Lord. So what do you do all of a sudden uh, when your fear drains you? You call on the Lord, concentrate on the Lord. Here you go. Uh, charge your enemy. By faith, charge. Amen. I tell people, don't run from your problems, run to your problems. Yeah. Yeah. Don't run from them. Tackle them and take care of them. If you run from them, they're going to be your problem tomorrow too. Amen. If you run from them, they're going to be your problem the next day too. All right, Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 10. Finally, my brethren, says, Be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. 
You can be strong in the Lord Jesus Christ. So tackle the problem. All right, statement number one. Uh, when, when your foe uh, dares you to retreat, you know what to do. Statement number two, when your fear drains you and wants you to retreat, you know what to do. What about when your fellow soldiers desert you? When all of a sudden you have a Christian walking beside you, you look around one day and they're gone. You look around one day and they've forsaken you. You look around one day, they're not praying for you anymore. You look around one day and they're not encouraging you anymore. Uh, the Bible says in 2 Timothy chapter 4 and in verse 10, Demas hath forsaken me, having loved this present world and is departed. The Bible says in uh, uh, 2 uh, 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 Timothy chapter 4 and in verse 11, the Bible says, only Luke is with me. Take Mark and bring him, it says, with thee, for he is profitable unto me for the ministry. Now listen, so here's what he did. He said, look, there's nobody standing beside me, but I remember that one, if you would, uh, that was Mark. And now he has shown himself. This is Paul. This is Paul. He didn't choose John Mark many years ago, but now he's choosing John Mark, saying, hey, come back. And uh, I, I trust him. He's going to be right there with me. But listen to what he says in verse 17, 2 uh, Timothy chapter 4 and verse 17. says, notwithstanding, the Lord stood with me and strengthened me. All right, so what do you do? Uh, all of a sudden, when your fellow servants desert you, sometimes you feel like retreating. Let me give you some antidotes. All right, you, you seek the real security in Christ. See, he'll never forsake you. He'll always be there beside you. Yes, when all of a sudden you feel like you're standing alone and you just can't make it, you feel like all of your friends have walked away from you, he said this over in Ephesians chapter 2 and in verse 13, he says, but now in Christ Jesus, ye who sometimes were afar off are made nigh by the blood of Christ. And so uh, we can feel close to the Lord Jesus all of a sudden when your friends forsake you. Uh, you can do this. Uh, you can find real security in Christ. You can seek refuge in others. You know, there's others that, hey, can, can I remind you please that there's others that still name the name of Christ. There are still others that stand for the very principles of the word of God. You're not by yourself. There's people that care about you. There's people that's on your side. Hey, look around. There's people in church today. There's people that sang the praises of God today. There's a preacher that's preaching right now. Uh, not just in our pulpit, but in other pulpits on our property right now. I'm saying this. I'm saying uh, you seek refuge in others. The Bible talks about a place of refuge. It says uh, for the convert, if you will, from the storm and from that which is the rain. Isaiah chapter 4 and verse 6. Then there's the reality through his word. You know, this is the reality book. Reality book right here. You say, is it true? Check it out from the Bible. Could it be true? Check it out through the Bible. Don't use science to try, if you would please, to prove the Bible. Use the Bible to prove science. Now understand this, uh, over in James chapter 1 and verse 21, the Bible says, Receive with meekness the engrafted word uh, which is able to save your souls. Then uh, let me give you just one last one, and we'll just go with four of them this morning for sake of time, and that is this. Uh, when, when all of a sudden you, you fight discouragement inside of you, what do you do? You decide that you're not going to retreat. When discouragement comes... Now, by the way, you will get discouraged. You will. Not everybody lives on the same plateau that you live on as a Christian. You ever seen a Christian not do what you thought they should do and it discourages you? You ever seen somebody that was but is no more? You ever see somebody that you thought, man, uh, this is this person is closer to Jesus Christ than anybody I've ever seen in my life. By the way, sometimes God takes them in death. Sometimes they die. I remember older preachers, I read, I preached a message here on now it's your turn. It's your turn in our youth conference. It's your turn. And I read down a list of all the preachers over the years that has had an influence in my life and they're gone. They're in heaven now. And I turned to our young people and said, hey, it's your turn. Yeah. Your turn. 
You're the next generation of believers that's going to make a difference. Either rise to it or run from it, but it's right there before you. You've got a decision to make. It's your turn. Now, can I tell you, uh, we understand this, that all of a sudden when the fight comes and the discouragement comes, do you understand? It's not time to retreat. You can still rise and you can still perform and you can still uh, uh, complete the task that God has for you if you simply just decide you're not going to let discouragement overcome you. Over in 2 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 1, the Bible says, I charge thee therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom. He says in verse 2, preach the word, be instant, in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. All right, now wait a minute. For me as a preacher, I can go back to the word of God and say, that's what he told me to do. I've got to do that or perish because that's the will of God for me. See, tomorrow morning I'll get up and keep the same duties. Uh, when I fly out to a different country, keep the same duties. When I fly out to preach a conference here in the U.S., keep the same duties. You know why? Because uh, it's in the DNA. That's what God's called me to do, and I have to rise to it. Here's a question for you. What's God called you to do? What's God called you to do? Are you missing your calling? Are you performing your calling? Are you living up to what God called you to do? Now, can I tell you, I love you in the name of the Lord, but you ought to be obeying Jesus Christ. Amen. You were not created for you. You were created for him. Amen. And you have to decide as a believer in Christ that you're going to be obedient to him. And sometimes this old, nasty world will discourage you. You'll have people that will stand up and you'll look at them and say, I just don't think I can, but I'm telling you, in the name of Christ, you can. Listen to it. What do you do when all of a sudden discouragement comes? First off, uh, you examine that which is the adversity. What is it that's causing you to be discouraged? You know, if you go to a doctor and you're not feeling well, here's what he does. He'll put you on the examination table or she'll put you on an examination table and say, okay, we need to examine you. Come on. And, and they will examine you. I went down to uh, the Cooper Clinic and went to, so, I've never seen so many doctors in all my day in one day. And they examined everything. I went to this one doctor, he was a, a skin doctor, and I laid on the table, and he said, well, he said, I'm not sure, he said, but there's a, there's a spot on your back, uh, looks like it could be cancerous. And I thought, okay, uh, he's going to have me come back. All of a sudden, he shot me in the back, I said, uh, what are you doing? He said, oh, we just cut it out right here. <laughs> so we went over and got his scaffold put a pretty good sized hole in my back, just kind of dug it out, sent it off to the lab. It came back benign. We shouted. We were happy. Yay! Still had a hole. <laughs> All right? Now, now wait a minute. D -d 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 come on. Maybe you get diagnosed and it's not that way. I think of Mrs. Gonzalez in the hospital, and, uh, uh, you know, her temperature has been high, and they put her in the hospital, and, and uh, you know, uh, here's a dear lady in our church that we love very deeply, fighting cancer. Uh, all right, now, wait a minute. Watch this. You know, sometimes you can get discouraged. Mrs. Stead's been in the hospital now for a long time, and, and, uh, and you know, sometimes you can get discouraged just being in the hospital. That's why we say when somebody goes in the hospital uh, around here, go by and see them. Yeah, it gets old looking at four walls. It gets old looking at the same nurse coming in all the time. It does. It gets old eating the same type of food all the time. Hey, look, I'm saying this. I'm saying, look, examine the adversity that you face 
But don't let that adversity overtake you. Here's what it says, 2 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 4. The Bible says, and they shall run away. It says, uh, it says their ears from the truth, uh, they're going to run away. They're going to turn away. They're going to go the opposite direction. Their ears from the truth, and they shall be turned onto fables. And don't, don't get so uh, all this stuff coming in that makes you believe a lie. There's always hope in the gospel. There's always hope in the gospel. I was out door knocking on Saturday, and uh, man, I went into this guy's house, and I'm telling you, I've never seen a house in such great order. O over on the kitchen counter was a ketchup bottle. Beside it was a uh, mustard bottle. Beside it was a relish bottle, and they were all in perfect alignment. I looked, and the pillows were facing the same way and had the streaks facing the same way. I mean, I looked at the carpet that had frays on the end, and it was all neatly combed out. I looked over in the corner, and the shoes were in perfect alignment. I looked over on the uh, other side, and there was a fireplace, beautiful fireplace, and across the fireplace, I mean, everything was in sequence. And I thought, this guy has got his act together. We begin to talk, and he began to share his heart. Stay with me now. And all of a sudden, he began to tell some of the hurts that was on his heart. I began to talk with him and counsel him and help him. Uh, already a believer, but I began to talk with him and help him and counsel him. Hey, you know, sometimes we come to church and we look pretty good. But can I tell you, when there's discouragements that come, and by the way, most of the time, when discouragements come, you're the only one that knows it. How many times have I spent behind the wheel driving somewhere uh, from the Dallas uh, Fort Worth airport or from Love Field driving and all of a sudden I begin to think about someone and my heart breaks and I just begin to cry. I cannot tell you how many times I've driven somewhere by myself and I begin to think about someone that's having a hard time, discouraged, defeated, down, just having a difficult time and I've got such a burden for them and I love them so deeply that I'll just begin to weep and I'll begin to pray and say, dear God, please give them some relief. Please help them in their personal life. Please, God, walk beside them and meet their need and, and help them to make this decision or that decision. Why? Because uh, they can get sidetracked by the adversities that take place in their life. All right? I I'm saying this. Uh, you, you examine those adversities. Statement number two, then you endure your afflictions. You know, some afflictions are made for your good. Why'd I get a flat tire? God might be in it. Maybe there's something you could learn from the flat tire that you could not learn from any other type of tire. Come on. Why is it that I've got the neighbor living next to me? Maybe you need that neighbor more than somebody else. There's nothing that you go through, it's by accident. 2 Timothy chapter 4 and in verse 9, the Bible says, but watch thou. In all things, endure afflictions. Do the work of an evangelist. Make full proof of thy ministry. For I am now ready, Paul said this in verse 6, I'm now ready to be offered. The time of my departure is at hand. So endure some of the afflictions. I remember sitting on an airplane one day and this guy, big guy, big guy. Now I'm telling you, uh, I enjoy sitting beside people, but this guy needed a bath. I mean, you know, you could smell the aroma, you know, and, and the air condition was not functioning right. Oh, man, I had a seat open next to me. And I'm thinking, oh, dear Lord, I love you, but please no. I mean, he comes tromping down the middle of that aisle, and, and you know, and I'm, I'm talking about I'm, I'm just an unclean individual. You know, and, and I don't know why, but he was. And man, he comes tromping down that aisle, and I'm sitting there minding my own business, and I'm looking up. There's only a couple of seats left, and I had one of them. And all of a sudden, he passed. And I thought, wow, praise the Lord. 
But somewhere on that plane, he got lost. And he found his way back to my seat. He looked at his number and looked down there, looked at his number, looked, you know, and he said, I think I'm sitting beside you. I said, well, come on in. He came in, he sat down. I'm a big guy now, big guy, big guy. He sat down, he's rolling over into my seat too. You know, I'm stuck against the window. I'm about like that. Now, now wait a minute, watch this. Did, did you know, you listen to me right now, please understand that for, for some, and again, I've got that, that, that you know, I've got, I always sit in the aisle now. Everywhere I go, I sit in the aisle. You say, why? That way I can get out. Because I, I got this thing I, I, now, just over the past couple years, where I feel kind of claustrophobic. So I'm not going to, because I can't fit through that window. <laughs> you know, I just can't do it. You know, and so, so I'll sit in the aisle all the time, always with the right elbow in the aisle because I'm always working. You know, and so, uh, but I'll sit in that aisle, and hey, I'm fine. But man, when he got in there, it was like, man. <sighs> You know, I, I think I'm going to be okay. But when I, then I was taking in that, you know, uh, yeah, and then I met rough. Now, for some of you, that's not an affliction. But for me, that was an affliction. Come on. But I, I'm saying this, I'm saying that you endure some affliction. Years ago, I came, uh, became allergic to sugar. It's been 20 plus years now, sugar. Sugar, Gran, uh, granulated white sugar. I can't have it. I blow up. Sugar. I thought often, why can't I be allergic to salt, Tabasco, but sugar? Now, I'm saying this, different afflictions for different people. So what do you do when those afflictions come? You endure them. Statement at last, and I'm done. Envision the appearance of Christ. Envision the appearance of Christ. Here's what Paul said, and I close it out. He said this in 1 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 7 as we continue in that passage. He said, I fought a good fight. I finished my course. I have kept the faith. Henceforth is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give to me at that day. And not to me only, but unto all them that love his appearing. So what do you do when all of a sudden it just seems like discouragement comes? Look forward to his appearing. It's just a little while and he'll be here. Look forward to it. Amen. Just look forward to it. Remember the story of one of the generals that was captured, the Philippine Islands. And he had let, him, let himself go as he was in this particular barricade that was a prison. And all of a sudden he went, he was a, a very good friend to uh, Douglas MacArthur. And there was a note, he'd always walk this, right beside this certain prison fence uh, every morning. He'd just walk. Apparently those on the outside of the prison that was getting ready to uh, cut him loose noticed his path. And he was the top general that was in this particular prison camp. So one morning, as he was walking along the fence line, he saw that there was a white piece of paper that was stuck in the fence. He pulled it out. It was from General Douglas MacArthur. They, they were buddies years ago. Went to the same school, came up in the ranks, named his name and said, don't worry, I'm coming. He took that little piece of paper. He had already given up hope. I mean, his, his uniform was all dingy. I mean, he was not taking care of himself. He thought, just, might as well just go ahead and give up hope and die. But when he saw that note, yes. all of a sudden he went back to the barricade, back to the prison stockade where he was being held prisoner, got out his uniform, got his old toothbrush out, began to polish those brass buttons, cleaned his uniform the best he could, went out and appeared before the men. The next day, attitude totally changing. He started to whisper, he's coming. He's coming, he's coming, he's coming, he's coming, he's coming, he's coming. The attitude of all those in those barricades all of a sudden changed. They started singing, they started eating, they started enjoying each other's fellowship again. 
You know why? I'm going to tell you why. Because there was hope. There was hope. I'm going to tell you as a believer, he's coming. He's coming. There's hope. Because in Jesus Christ, when you go through all of these adverse times, never lose the fact that the very next thing on God's prophetic timetable is rapture time. And we'll be able to see him face to face. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed. You say, preacher, I want you to pray for me this morning because I